Hello and thank you for joining me for this episode of The Still of the Night, the podcast where true crime meets the paranormal as we journey into the darkest corners of the past. I am your host Gemma Blackshaw and today's episode we are going back to a particularly disturbing true crime case in the 1800s. So grab your drink, turn down the lights as we venture into the still of the night. have heard people nonchalantly using the phrase sweet fanny adams but you may not know about the gruesome origin of the name and you can let me know once you've heard this tale whether you think this is a really bizarre way for a phrase to have originated fanny adams was born on the 30th of april 1859 in the village of alton hampshire to parents george and harriet she lived in Tanhouse Lane with her parents and her older sister and brothers, Ellen, George and Walter, and her two younger sisters, Lizzie and Lily. Sadly, she would never get to meet her youngest sister, Minnie, who was born in 1871. Alton, in general, was an area known for its large production of hops used in beer production. This was great for the local economy because, of course, many breweries set up nearby and offered employment opportunities, both in the breweries themselves and in the hop fields. Tanhouse Lane was quiet. It backed on to Flood Meadow, which connected to the river way. This then led to one of the many hop fields. Being surrounded by so many fields, it's only natural that children of the 1800s would play there, and the children and the adults all felt safe with this arrangement. So when, on the afternoon of the 24th of August, 1867, Fanny, aged eight at the time, asked her mother Harriet if she, her younger sister Lizzie, and her eight-year-old best friend Minnie Warner could go and play at Flood Meadow, her mum agreed, probably relieved to get the girls out of the house for a while on what was a fine and sunny day. Fanny was known as a lively and happy little girl though she was tall for her age and looked older than her eight years. She was friendly and intelligent and happily spoke with people she came in contact with. As the three young girls skipped their way along Tanhouse Lane and entered Flood Meadow, they came across a finely dressed, respectable man. 29-year-old Frederick Baker. Baker had moved to Alton around 12 months prior from Guildford in Essex after being offered a job as a solicitor's clerk at the practice of solicitor Mr Clements on the High Street. He was dressed in a dark coloured tailcoat and light trousers wearing a top hat. The girls recognised the face of Baker as they all went to the same church services though they did not know him well. Baker stopped the girls and engaged in conversation with them. He picked blackberries for the three girls to eat and stood and watched them playing and running around. Eventually, he offered Minnie and Lizzie three halfpence to go and get themselves some sweets. He offered Fanny a halfpenny to accompany him to the nearby village of Sheldon. Fanny took the money but refused to go. Minnie and Lizzie had gotten bored and said that they were going to go home. Baker tried to convince Fanny to go with him, but she refused again. Tired with trying to persuade her, Baker picked up Fanny and took her through Flood Meadow and into the hop field. Minnie and Lizzie ran back to Tanhouse Lane and told Minnie's mother, Martha Warner, what had happened. Martha made a decision that probably haunted her to the day she died. She didn't believe the girls and sent them out to play. Remember, these girls were very young. They didn't have the ability to be able to think about the consequences of what they had witnessed, nor understand the severity of the situation. They couldn't have possibly comprehended the brutality that Fanny was about to experience. Several hours later, at around 5pm, Minnie and Lizzie made their way home once more and ran into one of their neighbours, Mrs Gardner. Mrs Gardner knew that Minnie and Lizzie were always with Fanny and she asked where Fanny was. The girls told her the story of Baker and Mrs Gardner immediately ran to the home of Harriet Adams. Fanny's mother and Mrs Gardner set off to find the young girl. As they made their way, they came across none other than Baker himself. They questioned him about Fanny's whereabouts, but Baker claimed that he had given the girls money for sweets because he was so kind and generous and did that regularly for the local children. 
Cuthbert that he had left Fanny at the gate to Flood Meadow when he left. Whatever he said to the women must have been convincing because the women returned home, believing that Fanny was simply still playing in a nearby field. At around 7pm, Fanny still hadn't returned, so Fanny's mum, Harriet, and some neighbours went out again to search for the missing eight-year-old. At the same time, local man Thomas Gates had finished work for the day and was taking the shortcut home through the hop field, completely unaware of Fanny's disappearance. As he passed through the field, he came across an inconceivably gruesome sight. Resting on top of two hop poles was the severed and mutilated head of a child. As well as her head being severed, her attacker had removed one of her ears and made an incision that went from her ear to her mouth. Her arms and legs had also been removed from her torso. Her arm was severed at the elbow joint. Her left leg had been sliced at the hip joint and her right foot had been torn from her ankle. All of her insides had been removed along with her eyeballs which were later found thrown in the river. Her genitals had also been cut. In her little hand, she still clutched on to the money that Baker had given her. Her injuries were nothing short of barbaric. As news got back to Fanny's mother, Harriet collapsed when attempting to run to get her husband George from where he was playing cricket. When George was finally informed of what had happened to his young daughter, he is said to have got his shotgun and wanted to find the murderer, but he was stopped by neighbours who implored him to let the police handle it. I have to admit, I think I'd probably feel the same way as George. The next day, hundreds of locals headed up to the hop field to help locate more of Fanny's remains. Parts of her little body were found scattered all over. The remains of Fanny were taken to a nearby house called Leatham Bottle. Here the body was pieced back together as best they could before being taken to the police station for further tests. Meanwhile, the police were trying to work out who could have committed this horrific crime. They had one suspect, and that was Frederick Baker. The police tracked Baker to the solicitor's office where he worked. At 9pm, Baker was still there, working. Baker's respectability made it hard for the police to believe he was the man they were looking for, but as they had no other suspects, they had to arrest him. Baker protested his innocence, but his credibility would soon be washed away. On closer inspection, the police found small bloodstains on the cuff of his shirt and his trousers had already been washed. Baker was calm during his interrogation. Not what you'd expect from someone that was being falsely accused of murdering an eight-year-old child. But the biggest blow to his proclamation of innocence was a diary found at his workplace where Baker had written, quote, Saturday, 24th August, 1867. Killed a young girl. It was fine and hot. End quote. The police had been searching for a murder weapon but to no avail when someone brought in a stone that was covered in blood, flesh and human hair. It is believed that was used to kill Fanny. An eyewitness also came forward. A young boy who was a neighbour of the Adamses said that he had seen Baker come from the hop field with blood on his hands and clothing. He said he saw Baker walk to the river and wash himself. He also witnessed Baker putting a small knife into his pocket. Following an autopsy, it was believed that Fanny had died from a strong blow to the head, likely the stone that was found. After she had died, she had been brutally dismembered. Because she was already deceased, the blood would not come gushing out as it would had she still been alive, so it would have been unlikely that Baker would be drenched in her blood. On the 27th of August, 1867, an inquest was held into Fanny's death, which was commonplace to hold inquests immediately after death at that time. Minnie Warner and Harriet Adams both gave evidence pointing the finger firmly at Baker. The inquest determined that Baker was responsible for the death of Fanny. Baker was sent to Winchester Jail before his criminal trial took place on the 5th of December 1867. Baker's colleague said that Baker had left the office at 1pm on the 24th of August, returning at around 3.25pm. He then left again and returned at approximately 5.30pm. It was during the second period of absence that he spoke to Fanny's mother and Mrs Gardner. 
At around 6pm, Baker and his colleague went across the road to the Swan Pub. Baker spoke of his conversation with the two women and also spoke of possibly leaving Alton on the Monday. When his colleague said he would struggle to find her another job, he joked he could always be a butcher. The defence tried to claim that the knife found on Baker had been too small to dismember a body and called Baker's own father as a defence witness who claimed that Baker was a nervous and weakly child and couldn't possibly carry out such a crime. In regard to his diary entry, Baker's defence claimed that he was drunk when he wrote it and it was merely an acknowledgement of a girl's death and because he was intoxicated, he had forgotten to place a comma in the sentence. So it should have read, killed, comma, a young girl today. It was fine and hot. His defence also tried to claim that Baker was insane. The reason being that insanity was hereditary. His father was violent, his sister had died of brain fever and he had a cousin who was committed to an asylum. Baker himself had attempted suicide after a previous relationship had ended. Though the judge gave the jury opportunity to consider not guilty on the grounds of insanity, the jury deliberated for just 15 minutes and delivered the verdict that Frederick Baker was guilty of the willful murder of eight-year-old Fanny Adams. He was sentenced to hang. At 8am on the 24th of December, Christmas Eve, in front of a crowd of 5,000 people, Frederick Baker was executed by hanging. Interestingly, his was the last public execution held at Winchester Jail. Fanny Adams was buried in Alton Cemetery where her headstone still stands today and reads, Sacred to the memory of Fanny Adams, aged eight years and four months, who was cruelly murdered, August 24th, 1867. Fear not them which kill the body, but rather fear him who is able to kill both body and soul in hell. So how does the murder of a little girl get turned into a commonly used phrase? Well, it comes from the somewhat macabre humour of the British Navy. A couple of years after Fanny's death, the Navy were served chopped up mutton in tins. The soldiers would joke that it was so bad it must be the chopped up remains of sweet Fanny Adams. And so a phrase was born to mean something of little value or worthless. I wonder how many people... First of all, still use this phrase on a regular basis. And also, now you know the meaning behind it, would you use it? Would you continue to use it? If you have a historical true crime you would like me to take a look at, or a paranormal tale that you just cannot explain and you would like to be featured on the podcast, I would love to hear from you. The description section will have all the details for you to submit your story. That is all for today. Thank you so much for joining me for this episode. And I hope that you will come back to join me in the still of the night.